Have you ever watched a war picture on television or maybe a documentary on A&E or the History Channel and wanted to just weep at the stupidity of it? Maybe a Civil War dramatization where the two sides, the blue and the gray, just lined up in a field and went right against each other. Bullets tearing into the wall of flesh, cannonballs mowing down whole clumps of humanity that used to be husbands and fathers and brothers and sons. And it curdles your blood. The sick evil that is represented by this mad thing called war. They say that the first 25 minutes of Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan is probably the cinematic epitome of slaughter. Wave after wave after wave of men just mowed down by German machine gun fire as they tried to stagger on Omaha Beach, June 6, 1944. And maybe you're like me. You think to yourself, when I finally get to heaven, I'd like to ask God, why? Why in the world did you let this happen? Who's responsible for the more than 58,000 names inscribed on the Vietnam War Memorial? Some of my own high school buddies are etched there. Who are the men whose mad acts trigger these global holocausts, God? And what are you planning to do about it? Back on June 28, 1914 in Sarajevo, Bosnia, ring any bells? A Serbian nationalist assassinated Archduke Francis Ferdinand of Austria, Hungary, and his wife. The result? World War I. Four years, three months, and 144 days of pure, unrelenting hell. 32 countries involved, $200 billion in damages, a total of 37 million lives lost. And there may be among those of us who would like to spend some quiet time in the library up in heaven, staring into the computer terminals there and really peer through the divine looking glass and get a sense of what went wrong. Who did this? What price should be paid for those who lust for power, whose seared consciences cause so many others to suffer? I've already suggested that even though the true judgment scene of the ages happened back at Calvary, there are still four separate and distinct phases of divine judgment that will take place here in these last days. So what and when are they? In his marvelous book, God Cares, Volume 2, which is a study of Revelation's prophecies, my seminary professor, the late C. Mervyn Maxwell, takes us to the book of Daniel for the first judgment scene. Maybe you've studied the visions of Daniel, the four great beasts that represent the world empires of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Any good history book will validate the uncanny accuracy of what God showed his servant Daniel. Then the key events of the Middle Ages, where pagan Rome evolved into a global Christian power still centered in Rome. Of course, that historic timeline brings us right down into the last century or two. Then in chapter 7, beginning in verse 9, we find a heavenly scene where Jesus, or as the Bible puts it, one like the Son of Man approaches the Ancient of Days. Verse 10 tells us, The court was seated and the books were opened. I've already suggested that we could call this a kind of pre-Advent judgment. It happens in the last days, the timelines of history, and this event happening after the world empires and after the events of the Middle Ages brings us down to the modern era. And we have Jesus Christ up in heaven coming together with his Father to open the books. And certainly before the second coming of Jesus to this earth, a determination has got to be made about who's saved and who's lost. Over in Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1, we find this reference to the second coming. But at that time, 
After the trouble and distress at the end, your people, everyone whose name is written, found written in the book, will be delivered. So a decision is made and made public. Who has a relationship with God and who doesn't? That's judgment, isn't it? And what a wonderful thing it is to know that Jesus and God are together in wanting you and me to be found in relationship with them. That's fantastic assurance. But then Jesus comes again, the second coming. The Bible talks over and over about this guarantee. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. And Christ himself in his parable about the sheep and goats found in Matthew 25 does separate the human race into these two groups, saved and lost, redeemed and unrepentant. I guess that's not really judgment, but simply carrying out the judgment he and his father already accomplished in the heavenly courts above. Although for us, it will seem like judgment happens then. Well, you would think that the great sheep and goats metaphor would be the end of it all. But there's a phase three. And that's what I've already alluded to. If you go over to Revelation chapter 20, we discover that during what the Bible calls the millennium or the thousand years, saved people just like you and me will sit up there in heaven on thrones and judge. I saw thrones, John the Revelator writes, on which were seated those who have been given authority to judge. And right here during these thousand years is when we can look at the video monitors and finally pin down just what happened and why and how. World War I and two. Why a plane went down with your loved one on it. Why God allowed your spouse to die of leukemia. What really happened with the JFK assassination and the O.J. Simpson trial? Who is guilty and how guilty? Did God do right when he saved such and such person? Or when he didn't save someone you thought would surely have a front page address in the heavenly book of life? And perhaps we're doing two things really during the millennium and this phase three. First of all, we're just satisfying our minds regarding the judgment decisions that God and Jesus have already made. Now, maybe you won't feel like doing that. On the other hand, maybe you already do have some questions. And what a quietly comforting and faith-building thing it will be to go through the evidence yourself at a human pace, carefully, thoughtfully. And time after time, your heart is satisfied when you discover that through all the horrors of this planet's sad history, the wars and rumors of wars, the planes that went down, the people who had so many opportunities to choose Jesus Christ and never did, you discover that God always did the wisest thing. I wouldn't change a thing, you finally say, as you marvel at his wisdom and love, his second and third mile efforts to save the lost. I've already confessed how I like the way Dr. Jack Blanco describes the first angel's message here in Revelation 14. Stand in awe of God and give glory to him because the time has come for him to clear his name and to judge the world. But there's one more thing, because although sentence has been passed on those who have rebelled against God, that sentence hasn't been carried out yet. The destruction of the wicked happens, the Bible says, at the end of the thousand years. You can read it here in chapter 20, starting in verse 7. After all is said and done, after Satan's last attempt to overthrow the city, the Bible tells us, but fire came down from heaven and devoured them. This is a hard truth, and yet good truth, really, because devoured is devoured. 
I believe God is able to completely sweep away all traces of sin and evil at the end. After all, chapter 21 is entitled, The New Jerusalem. But is it possible that some of those who rebelled with the greatest ferocity or who helped to trigger and mastermind World War I back in 1914 will experience more heartache and more mental anguish and maybe even more pain when God's last outpouring of holy fire consumes the rebel armies? And perhaps that is partly what the saints in heaven will participate in deciding during those thousand years. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 asks, Don't you realize that we Christians will judge and reward the very angels in heaven? Meaning the rebel angels of Satan, certainly, who are the only ones slated to receive divine punishment. Well, that's it, the judgment, happening in a way that brings you and me into a full and unshakable appreciation for the wisdom of God and the incredible love of Jesus in saving us. Let me say this before we move on. The way you've learned these Revelation mysteries might be dramatically different from what you're discovering here. I know that. I've got books here in my office library from good and wise Christian students, and my, what a variety of scenarios are there. And these are godly people. We've got to be so humble in our study and as we pray for each other. But the bottom line is this. Jesus saves. Hold on to that. Hold on to Jesus. Judgment is a wonderfully moot Bible study topic if you're committed to Him, and if you're trusting in Him, and if you're living daily and hourly in the shadow of His saving cross.